Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalists. I'm Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan, and we post a video every week, so why not press subscribe and the alert button so that you can keep up with what we're doing. I would, and if you have a burning horticultural question for Stephen, do put it in the comments below, and every Monday we answer them in our shorts. Actually, I don't, you do. Which is, uh, and make sure you tell me where you're from so that I have a sense of context. Absolutely. It's a beautiful summer's afternoon in rural Australia, Stephen. What are we doing? Ah, well, we're actually in a perennial garden uh, designed by my friend, Michael McCoy, and we're going to discuss summer flowering perennials. Excellent. This is a garden full of them, so we'll choose some of them here. Yep. But I think we also visited a fantastic garden a few weeks ago to look at their collection of summer flowering perennials. What was that garden again? Yes, that was Manani, where we went and looked at the giant Himalayan lilies. Yes, giant mm. Himalayan lilies. So let's step back in time and look at the summer flowering perennials we found there. Well, Stephen, our summer perennial extravaganza continues. I thought I knew what this was. Yes. Actually, oh, look at that astolabe. No. And it's not a Rogersia. Which I also thought it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, well, then yeah. it's a Rogersia. No. What is and it, it's, Stephen? It's actually a very small genus, and I think there's only the one species recognised now. Yeah. And it's a Runcus dioecius, which is commonly known as goat's beard. Aha. Uh -huh. And a more elegant perennial would actually be rather hard to find. It is, it is beautiful. And yeah. we're in a very beautiful 19th century garden called... Manani. Manani. So thank you very much to the generous owners for letting us be here today. And these sort of line steps that go almost to Nirvana by the looks of it. <laughs> yeah, they, they do go on forever. It's breathtaking in more ways than one. It is. By the time you get to the top. But my observation is this is quite shady. It is. Aruncus is a cool, moist area plant. Mm. So it doesn't like the really hot afternoon sun. Mm. It does need a soil that stays reasonably moist. In mm. fact, it could almost be a marginal bog plant mm -hmm. as Rogers is and a lot of the other relatives can be. Yeah. And it's probably one of the most elegant of the whole group. Uh, it flowers in early to mid summer and in the Southern hemisphere that would take us well after Christmas. Yeah. So it flowers at a great time of the year when the rhododendrons, azaleas and most of those other things are pretty well finished. Mm. It has a very attractive compound leaf in a nice mid green color. Very and, lovely leaves. And these enormous panicles of tiny white fluffy flowers, which I find seriously appealing. They are. So I guess two questions. Firstly, could you cut the flowers? Would they last? I don't think it'll last well. I've not mm. tried, but I just have this uh, feeling. feeling. Yes. This some, some of feeling. our viewers might in fact be able to tell us whether it's a good plant to cut or not, but it certainly lasts well in the garden. And the other thing about it is it has a little bit of height. It does. It's quite big. Now the leaves look very beautiful. They look to me as though they'd have colour when they die down. Uh, yes or no? A little bit. It will go sort of yellowish colours before it dies down. So it's mm. not going to be a top ranking autumn coloured right. foliage perennial, but it will have some impact. And I actually, once the flowers have died and the petals have dropped off, the old seed heads can be still quite structural and interesting. Oh, so that's very that, Pierre Udolf. Yeah, well, it is very Pierre Udolf, but it's uh, it's actually something that I think most gardeners now are accepting of the fact of using uh, dead and seed dying heads. matter yeah. and seed heads and things as something textural and interesting in the garden. So yes. it just takes a little bit of a mind change. Okay. Uh, and then you can get used to things like yeah. that. I mean, this definitely isn't a prairie, um, but it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great perennial. You don't see it around in Australia terribly often. I mm. guess its requirements would lend people or would lead people to believe that they can't grow it. Mm. And I have to say in lots of areas, they probably can't. So mm. it does need the sort of cooler environment to grow well, mm. but definitely worth it if you've got the right spot for it. Uh, it will make a wonderful feature plant. And where is this from in the world? Well, it has a very wide distribution if you accept the fact that it's basically one species mm. and it grows through lots of cooler parts of Europe, even down into northern Spain and areas like that, right across Europe and also into Asia. So it has a very wide distribution. Mm. I think it could be grown in uh, most cooler temperate sort of areas. So avoid the tropics, avoid the deserts and you should be able to grow Aruncus. There you go. Well, I'm looking forward to the next. All right. Stephen Ryan, summer perennials. Yes, and this one is definitely not for the faint-hearted gardener. Oh, why? Well, because if it's happy where you plant it, it can take off. 
So you end up with huge colonies of it. It's looking happy here. Yeah, it is. It's it's and making actually, quite a big colony. Yeah, and there's another one further down the border, and another one even further down the border. Mm. So this is commonly known as plume poppy, uh, Maclea cordata. Now, believe it or not, the common name plume poppy is actually quite appropriate mm. because it's believe it or not in the poppy family. Right. So I'm confused. Is this it? That's the flowers. They're in bud still. They'll open up, but they're just a little bit of fluff. Right. So it will get a little bit fluffier, but that's basically what the flower does. So it's not ringing my bell, Steve. No, but it may not. But please, please, please look at the foliage. Oh, well, that is very beautiful. It is a gorgeous foliage plant. These large, intricately um, serrated silvery gray leaves on towering tall stems. Mm. Uh, and when the flowers do fluff out a little bit more, they do make more presents. But it's not so much, even though we're talking about summer flowering for perennials. In the case of this one, it's as much about its structure. Uh, and it's beautiful foliage, which it holds right through until the autumn. Mm. So it's botanically known as Maclea cordata, mm -hmm. comes from Japan and China. So it's an Asian perennial, uh, likes a sunny-ish aspect or it'll cope with semi-shade. It's in full sun here. Yep. The richer the soil, the more invasive it becomes. <laughs> So if you're actually in a slightly poor soil, you might be able to hold it back a little bit, mm. but it probably won't grow to the same statuesque height with the same big leaves. And in terms of its invasiveness, is it through rhizome or seed? No, it's, it's from creeping from the roots, yes. Mm. So um, the roots go out and then it will send up another sucker out off the roots. Right. And so the colony just keeps marching sideways. Mm. I do have to say, though, it doesn't normally go terribly deep. So it's probably not, not much more than a sharp spade away from keeping it in order. We're all a sharp spade away from being <laughs> kept in order. <laughs> yes, well, you could look at it that way as well. All right, well, I'm looking forward to the next. All right, fantastic. That garden is amazing, and those giant lilies have stayed with me forever, Steve. Yes, and they will. I mean, once you've seen them, never forgotten. It is a beautiful place. Where to next? All right, well, we're going to visit some more friends of mine that have a very quirky and remarkable garden uh, in a little settlement called Piper's Creek near Kyneton. Mm. And we're going to have a look at a perennial that they've got that is truly outstanding. Oh, can't wait. This literally stopped me in my tracks. What is this? Well, this is an iconic North American plant uh, called Romnia culturae, uh, commonly known as the Californian tree poppy. Mm -hmm. And it grows tall, as you can see here. It's what, two and a half, three meters tall. Massive. But it really isn't a tree as such. It's really a large semi-herbaceous perennial mm. and you should in fact prune the old stems out once they finish flowering like those ones uh, because they don't flower again mm. so i normally if i've got a clump of it in the garden i would normally prune the flowered stems out as they finish flowering mm -hmm. now, there's only two species this one colteri and another one called trichocalyx and trichocalyx has slightly smaller and more crinkly flowers so it's more poorly ironed the flowers are sometimes rudely known as fried eggplant. Well, honestly, that's what I saw. It just looked like massive fried eggs yeah. bouncing uh, on the end of it. And it's really tendril. weird because it is slightly scented, mm. but you don't smell it when you put your nose into it. It's a perfume you'll pick up from a distance. I can smell it here, but I can't smell it in the flat. Yeah, and it's so, a beautiful light note. Yes. And as far as growing it is concerned, it really is quite happy as long as it has a well-drained site mm -hmm. uh, with a reasonable amount of sun. It will grow in quite a range of different conditions. And in fact, one of Barry and Ruth's has grown up through the cavity of a wall and has grown out through near the, uh, the guttering on their shed. So uh, it's become a roof plant. Uh, and I have heard of Romneas coming up through the cavities in walls, ending up in the back of wardrobes. Goodness knows where it-, wow. it will. tenacious. It, it is quite tenacious, but it's really weird because if it's happy where you put it, it could be considered a thug mm. and you can end up with large quantities of it. But a lot of people will plant it and they'll lose it time after time after time, even if they're doing all the right things. Mm, why is so that? It's just, well, technically it's miffy. <laughs> it's one of those plants that either likes you and will go nuts mm, or like it doesn't like you at all and it just won't cope even though you have the right conditions. All right, so I would say this is a thicket. Yes. Now, is this really a practical plant for your average garden? So here we are on acreage and we can allow this to form a thicket, but if you wanted it in a, in a sort of Mediterranean perennial border, would it be containable? 
Uh, it's probably not containable if it's happy. It will keep moving around. <laughs> but I have to say the flowers are so good yeah. that I wouldn't really mind if it became a dominant part of a major border, and mm. it can. Mm. So if it's really happy, it can sucker for feet and feet and feet, or mm. metres and metres and metres, uh, and you can end up with Romnia in huge drifts. The back of your wardrobe. Yeah, back of your wardrobe even. But it's funny because you try and dig out a, a sucker, and probably half to two thirds of them won't take. Mm. So it's actually not all that commonly available commercially because mm. it's quite hard to propagate. It hates having its roots disturbed. Mm. Uh, and in fact, if you get a little carried away and you try and dig out too much and you take bits out of the whole colony, mm. sometimes the whole colony will just collapse and die. Oh, so uh, there you go. I'm seeing a lot of seed pods. Yeah. Is it easy to germinate, propagate from uh, seed? It can be propagated from seed, but not generally considered that easy. Mm. So sometimes it'll strike, sometimes it won't. But uh, that's part of the allure of some of these plants. Somebody wants them and they can't grow it. Other people can't get rid of it. And so, you know, it is one of those interesting plants. Well, it's very happy here. Now, whereabouts is it from in California? Uh, well, it comes from drier areas of California. Mm. Uh, so I would say sort of southern parts of California. And I've got a sense that it might be in some of the surrounding states as well. So... Now, you said it's, it's basically a herbaceous perennial. So does that mean it could be hardy because it basically dies down every year? Well, I've seen it growing in the garden at Bodnant in Wales. Oh, right. uh, so it will grow in quite a range of climates as long as it has a nice, sunny, well-drained site. Mm. So uh, it's a matter of making it happy. Once it's happy, it will grow in much colder climates than here. Mm. It will also grow in probably hotter, drier climates than here. I think, though, that really humid subtropical climates would probably be a problem for it. It is the most fantastic summer flowering perennial. Yes, well, it is rather. <laughs> And I literally walked past that and said, it looks like a fried egg. Yeah, and it is one of its common names. So there you go. Yeah, so fried egg plant. I much prefer giant um, tree poppy. Giant uh, tree poppy. It sounds a little more, more romantic than a fried egg plant. It but does. I, I see the content. <laughs> and many thanks, Barry, because Barry gave me a little uh, sucker of that plant, which is doing really well. I'm here to tell you all. Yes, well, and goodness knows where you're going to plant it. But anyhow. Oh, Stephen, don't, <laughs> don't clip my wings. Yeah. But now... Here we are. Should we just venture forth and look at some of the wonderful flowering perennials here? I think that's a fantastic idea. All right. Well, this is a perennial that I've always had quite a soft spot for. Yes. And it does lots of things in your border. Mm -hmm. uh, it's vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's blue. Yes. Its foliage is silver. Blue yes. and silver work really, really well together. And it's a thing that up until quite recently was known as Porofskia atroplicifolia, mm -hmm. which I love the name of. Mm -hmm. But it's now been sunk into the genus Selvia. So it's now Selvia atroplicifolia. And it does have the most beautiful... I want to hold yeah, it Yeah, here. that's not going to help. The most fragrant leaves. <laughs> yeah. Now, Porofsky is also a great insect attractor. Uh, this is lightly self-seeding itself around in the border. Mm. And when it dies in the autumn, or dies back, it leaves these silver-looking stems standing up in the winter. Oh, right. So it has quite a presence right through until towards the end of winter yeah. when you need to get in and cut it all down. Mm. And so I think Porofsky, or unfortunately now salvia atroplicifolia. Um, no shade on the salvias, but anyway. Yeah, well, a lot of the salvia experts out there aren't happy about lots of things being <laughs> dumped in with salvia, but you know, it is what it is and we have to get used to it. So I think it's a great plant and it's particularly good when it's allowed to be grown en masse so that you get a really big drift of it. It's stunning. Another great summer flowering perennial. Yes, and there are lots of them that we probably won't get to, but anyhow, you'll get a taste. Well, you've mentioned, well, we've mentioned the bees a bit, but I don't know if you can see, viewers, but this garden is just a cloud of butterflies, bees and birds and probably many, many other insects. Yes, it's things just, we can't even see. No, it's alive with activity, which is so, it's just so great to see, isn't it? And it's interesting too, because it's surrounded by um, open paddocks, pastures, whatever you mm, want to call them, farming nothing, land. Nothing flowering. Nothing flowering. And yet the insects have managed to find this little insect oasis mm. on their own. Mm. So you can do it anywhere. You can, you can. More summer flowering perennials, Stephen yes. Ryan. And this one has a specific connection to me, funnily enough. Mm. So... Dahlias are a very popular and useful group of summer flowering perennials. Everybody knows about them. They know that they make great, great cut flowers. Uh, they're good garden plants. And there are probably thousands of named varieties out there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of them. And it's beautiful. It's single. 
it's virginal white, it's self-supporting, and very, very slightly perfumed. Yes, and, and it's, it's called... Dahlia Stephen Ryan. <laughs> Ta-da, yes. Dahlia Stephen Ryan. Yeah. No, it's a great honour to have something named after well, you. It, it is indeed, and I feel very honoured to have had a Dahlia named after me. And also something that's vigorous and not just, you know, some limp little oh. pathetic thing that struggles for existence. This! Yes, it's a good, strong, gutsy Dahlia. Uh, it's very good at uh, attracting pollinators because, mm. of course, single Dahlias have a lot of pollen, so the bees and hoverflies oh, right. and things love them. Yeah. And I know our friend Alexander at the middle size garden is very passionate about Dahlia Stephen Ryan more so than she is about Stephen Ryan I think so she grows it in her own garden in England mm. so it's becoming sort of known around the world and mm. uh, it's quite a simple dahlia it's not tricky and complicated like some of the show dahlias are mm. uh, but as, as a, a cut lot flower like a, you yeah <laughs> no, like me yeah but as a cut flower in a garden plant it is great so I'm yeah. very very honoured and flattered to have a dahlia named after And I think one of the things you've mentioned is it's one of the first dahlias to bloom yes. and the last to die down. Yeah, it has a remarkably long He's a goer, it's, Stephen Ryan. Yeah, and it won't shut up like me. <laughs> so there you go. All right, on to the next. Ooh, Stephen, contentious summer flowering perennial. It is, at least in this country, it's an interesting thing. People either absolutely adore or absolutely abhor Agapanthus. And I can see both sides of the story. Mm. I mean, in certain areas, it's become quite weedy. Uh, although having said that, if you manage it in your garden and you take the flower heads off before it goes to seed, it can't go weedy. So mm -hmm. it can be about a management issue. And of course, in some climates, it's not a weedy issue. So therefore, why not use them? I mean, they're high summer flowering. There are some wonderful blue forms out there. And this one is one of, I think, one of the best selections of blue that we have here in Australia. Mm. And this is Agapanthus gilfoil. Mm -hmm. uh, it was found in the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne as, oh. a, as an unnamed clone. And I think David Glenn at Lambley Nursery at Ascot decided to give it a name and he decided to call it Guilfoyle after William Guilfoyle, who was the second director of the Botanic Gardens. And we've made a whole series of films in the Botanic Gardens, which we'll link below. Yes, go in and have a look. It's a great place. Now, give me a bit of the history. Where is Agapanthus from? It's South African, isn't it? Yes, Agapanthus are all restricted mainly to uh, southern parts of Africa. You see a lot of them growing in the Eastern Cape area. Uh, they tend to grow in areas where there is some summer rain, and yet, funnily enough, they're incredibly drought tolerant. Mm. Uh, in cold climates, there are a certain number of them that are properly herbaceous in the winter, and they're the best ones to grow in the colder climates. Guilfoyle is one of the evergreen agapanthus, which will work well as a foliage plant for the winter here, yeah. as well as giving the fabulous rich blue flowers in the summer, but probably isn't as cold hardy uh, in the colder climates like Europe and North America mm. uh, as some of the herbaceous ones. But I think Guilfoyle is a fantastic agapanthus and I'd like to see more of it being used in this country. Okay. Well, how is that for some interesting plant material, I have to say? Yes, and perennials, is it fair to say perennials are really the plant du jour? They're kind of having their moment in the sun, pardon the pun, summer flowering perennials. Yes. Oh, well, we, must, we must acknowledge the pussycat. That's, yeah, yes. I don't know where who pussycat that is but it's been following us around yes it seems to need some company and we just happen to be it so perennial yes, sorry perennials yes back to perennials yes summer flowering perennials i have to say i'm not sure it's du jour i think mm. it's been going on for quite a long time mm. i mean if you think about it in australia certainly in the uh, 1960s and a little later there was that sort of a cottage garden thing that sort of hit yeah um, and so that meant people wanted to grow a lot more perennials and bulbs um, so it comes and goes and of course there's been big pushes uh, in Europe and North America for perennial planting since. So I think that's what I mean you know that which is basically I'm alluding to prairie planting which is really perennial planting isn't it? It is to a large extent it's, uh, but it does concentrate quite a lot more these days on the grass species yes. than it once did I mean mm. the cottage garden wasn't about grasses. No more it about was about flowers. flowery yeah. things yeah, yeah. so uh, and also I think uh, gardeners as a group have matured a little bit since that time mm. and there's also a lot more about colour coordinating making sure you've got interesting verticals and horizontals. Sculpture. It's a, yeah, yeah it's a little bit more um, aesthetically pleasing than a jumble of cottage garden flowers. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much to the very generous owners for allowing us to wander around this garden today. 
And of course, if you want to know what we're doing next week, don't forget to subscribe and press the alert button and we'll be taking you on some other sort of adventure. And remember, if you have a question for Stephen, do put it in the comments below and say where you're from and we'll try and answer it in our Monday shorts. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye all.